Hello, and welcome to another 15 Minutes with Your Bible. Let's pray. Our Father which art in heaven, please open our eyes now so that we may see the wonders in Your Word and help us to apply them to our, de our lives daily, today, and always. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I hope you have your Bibles with, with you. I have my New King James Version, and we're studying again from Bible reading under the subheading in Chapter 1 of Power in the Word. The next question is, what purifies the hearts of believers? And the answer to that can be found in John 15, verses 1 through 4. St. John 15, verses 1 through 4. What purifies the hearts of believers? It reads, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you, unless you abide in me. So in John 15, 1-4, Jesus clearly makes it clear that it is the word that purifies the hearts of believers. Jesus is speaking to his disciples at the Last Supper. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it, it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because, and listen, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. So it's God's word that purifies the heart. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. John 15, 1 through 4. Now the next question is, what promise does Jesus give to those who remain in him and keep his word in their hearts? The answer to that is found in verses 5 and 8 of St. John 15. Verses 5 and 8. What promise does Jesus give to those who remain in him and keep his word in their hearts? And it reads in verses 5 through 8, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered and they gather them and throw them in the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Wow, that says a lot. It's telling me that it's only when I abide in Christ and He in me that I can ask whatever I desire and it would be done. And the reason why it's going to be done is because when I ask, I would be asking based on what God wants for me because I'm dwelling in Him. But He promised us that if a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. He also promises that if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you can ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. The next question is, how can we live out Jesus' word to us? How is it possible to live out the word that Jesus gave to us? Verses 9 through 17 tells us the answer. John 15, 9 through 17 and it reads as the father loved me I also have loved you 
abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friend. You are my friend if you do whatever I command you. Let's read that again. You are my friends, chapter 14, sorry, verse 14, if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit shall remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. He says it again. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask, the Father in my name he will give you these things I command you that you love one another so how can we live out Jesus' word to us by obey, obeying his commandments like he said remain in his love and to love each other as he has loved us and the answer was found in John 15 verses 9 through 17. The next question is, how can the young keep their way pure? Psalms 119 9. How can the young people keep their way pure? Psalms 119 9. Psalms 119 9 says, how can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. It's simple. Following God's word is how a young person can keep their way pure. The next question is how may we guard our hearts from sin? The answer is found in Psalms 119 verses 10 and 11. Psalms 119 10 and 11. It reads, With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. So the way that young people can keep their way pure, as we said, is by guarding it according to the word. And we can keep and guard our hearts from sin by hiding the word of God in our hearts. In other words, we read and study it and then we keep it in our minds and in our hearts. In the Bible, the, the Bible often talks about the heart as being the mind or interchangeably so that if it's in our heart, it's really in our mind that, that we may not sin against Him. I want to know one thing, the way to heaven, how to land on that happy shore. God himself has condescended to teach the way. For this very end he came from heaven. He has written it down in a book. Oh, give me that book. At any price, give me that book of God. I have it. Here is knowledge enough for me. Let me be a man of one book. John Wesley said that. Now we add another subheading in Bible reading. That subheading is the living, giving word in chapter 1. What is the nature of the word of God? We've talked about the importance of the word, the power of the word. Now what is the nature of the word? The question can be answered by reading Hebrews 4 verse 12. What is the nature of the word of God? Hebrews 4 verse 12. 
Hebrews 4 verse 12 reads, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intent of the heart. So we see the nature of the Word of God, living and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And maybe that's part of the reason why some of us don't want to study the Word too often because we begin to feel things, we be begin to see our sinful nature and we really don't want to hear that because we want to just do what we want to do but the Bible points out our errors and it corrects us like we read earlier in one of our studies so it is a very powerful word that has the nature of being sharper because it cuts into our consciences the next question is what lesson did God teach through the miracle of the manna in the wilderness the answer to that is found in Deuteronomy 8 verse 3. Deuteronomy 8 verse 3. And it reads, So he humbled you, allowing you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know, that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. So the answer to the question, what lesson did God teach through the miracle of the manna in the wilderness, is he humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna. And he wanted to teach them that man does not live on bread alone, physical bread, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. In other words, the word of God, that bread is what he wanted to teach them, was very important, more, even more important than physical bread. Jesus quoted this text when tempted by Satan, remember, Matthew 4.4. 4. The next question is, how did Jeremiah describe the feeding on God's word? Jeremiah 15 verse 16. The next question is, how did Jesus speak of such spiritual food? John 4:34. John 4 verse 34. It says, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. What name of Jesus describes him as the revelation of the thought of God in the flesh? What name of Jesus describes him as the revelation of the thought of God in the flesh? The next question is, what name of Jesus describes him as the revelation of the thought of God in the flesh? The answer to that can be found in Revelation 19.13. Revelation 19.13 says, He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So the name that describes Jesus as the revelation of the thought of God in the flesh is the Word of God. What did this Word become? John 1, 14. John chapter 1, verse 14. John chapter 1 verse 14 says, 
And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. And that Word was Jesus. Thank you for spending your 15 minutes with me today. And I'll